Welcome to the Civic Leader Podcast. I'm Sylvie Legere. I'm the co-founder of the Policy Circle. And today we will be reading uh, the Policy Circle Brief on Stitching the Fabric of Neighborhood. Uh, the, the Policy Circle is a real framework for real conversation. And at the basis of it is these Policy Circle Briefs. The idea is that everyone reads the brief, reviews the brief, and come together to engage in, in a real conversation uh, to expand their knowledge, to take ownership of something they want to change, and really to build relationships uh, with, with other people uh, to challenge or encourage change that they uh, want to see. So uh, today I invited Heather Ways Kids uh, to join me to read the brief. And uh, we will be reading and kind of collaborating in the reading and discussing uh, the brief as we go. And uh, so welcome, Heather. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Heather, I'm so excited because I know uh, to have you, um, you know, read the brief and share your experience and your thoughts. You come with, you've dedicated your life to civic and community engagement. Yeah. Uh, you spent 20 years advocating for small businesses and nonprofits organization. You have a passion for building strong communities through your work uh, with the Chicago Cubs, where you are uh, associate director of uh, community affairs. And, and also you, you do work with the Lakeview uh, Chamber of Commerce, which is Lakeview is a neighborhood in Chicago area. And while you were at the chamber, actually you participated in many initiatives, such as creating a Lakeview area a master plan mm -hmm. and uh, later I guess you, the neighborhood won an international recognition uh, as Lakeview was named one of the best big city neighborhoods to live in by CNN Money Magazine so yeah. um, that's really exciting and you've collaborated on just a number of projects with public agencies with the city of Chicago uh, that range from the, the CTA, Lincoln Avenue, Streetscape, um, community engagement and then you're also uh, really involved in uh, the schools and also in volunteering in your community. You really believe in volunteerism and I'm sure we'll have a chance to really explore everything, yeah. everything that you do. So thank you so much for, uh, for being here and I hope everyone will enjoy uh, the reading of this brief, uh, Stitching the Fabric of Neighborhoods. Thank you. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll start and then we'll alternate. You know, strong neighborhoods and communities have, a long, have long been the central components of American life. And how technologies, social trends change neighborhoods over time. The local business owners on Main Street, the members of city council and residents living in the suburbs all play an important role in the future of neighborhoods. So what do people today want in their community? It, it's, it's a really big issue and it's a reason uh, for this brief because we all want to have uh, be part of a vibrant community and we don't know necessarily where, where to start or, or pinpoint what really makes a community so vibrant. And this is the attempt of this brief, is describing all of the pieces that when put together, um, really create a beautiful mosaic of a neighborhood. Um, so, so I'll read the, uh, the introduction here. Um, Strong communities are in this, I kind of read that. Uh, David Bohegian, who's, who's uh, acting president and CEO of the US Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC, looks at sidewalks when he thinks of neighborhood, when he travels around the world. He says, I think the way you judge a neighborhood is by the sidewalks. We talk about capital often, financial capital, but social capital is built on sidewalks. Sidewalks can offer beauty in the form of well-paved roads, paths around green spaces and central areas. Prosperity, as business can grow where there is foot traffic, providing more gathering places that expand opportunities for human connectedness. 
So for more on these three areas of impact in neighborhoods, there's an organization that's called Conscious Capitalism that also provides a lot of information around that. So what else do people today want in their communities and how else are America's communities and the face of Main Street changing is a loss of personal connections through digitization impacting communities and who plays a role in fixing communities that may be on the decline. So um, I know that you're involved in uh, cleanups and this sounds yes. a lot like uh, Lakeview actually and, yes. and your involvement, right? Yes, it does. It's like my passion project is picking up litter, but I really uh, believe um, that a clean neighborhood is very important. And, you know, on the surface, we understand why, you know, from the beautification efforts, but as we'll discuss you know, about why it matters and in, in the follow-up to this case study, it's, it's more than that. Like human connections are made during that process. Neighbors get to meet neighbors. Um, and one benefit I think that's great that is maybe not top of mind, especially in my role, is every time I organize like a neighborhood clean and green event, all of the elected officials come to participate because it's a great photo op for them and a chance for them to see their constituents. So while you're out, you know, in the more casual setting, it's a great way to build that relationship as well, you know, and perhaps, you know, talk about things that are top of mind um, with the elected officials, whether it's, um, you know, based on like a residential concern or a business concern as, as well. Like just by example, for the neighborhood cleanups that we organize with our neighborhood groups around Lakeview, our local Congressman, Mike Quigley comes to every single event. You know, how often do you get that one-on-one -on -one interaction with your Congressman? You know, a lot of people can't say that. So it's a great benefit in that regard as well, which is really, yeah, you, you know, don't think a about happy that, coincidence. Right? No, not at all. Yeah, you don't when you organize a cleanup. And also, I think there's, there's something about really taking ownership mm -hmm. of your neighborhood. You really yeah. assume, and this is, you assume that somebody else is taking care of sanitation, right. and you blame the city, and you're like, it's not cleaned up. And yeah. especially in an urban area where there's so much traffic, so many foot traffic people, there's always something. Right. Events, you, you can't, the, the sanitation of the city can't really keep up right. with just right. the daily. And, and I think right. there's also opportunities for even engaging with um, organizations that give a second chance to people yeah. and it could be their first job, but to have citizens participate in it, yeah. you really have ownership. Right. And, uh, but, but well, it's, yeah, how is it run though? Like, so, so this is in New York, there's like a cleanup or nonprofit organization, there's members. So is it the same in Lakeview that you're yep. part of the leadership of, you yep. need strong leadership. Like yeah. people make it their project, right? Yeah, so. It doesn't just um, happen. Yeah, no, it doesn't just happen. It actually does take a lot of effort. So the way our group came together was uh, a neighbor who lives near Wrigley Field approached us about putting together a volunteer effort, you know, because he was already, you know, picking up trash on his own when he would take his dog out for a walk in the morning. And so he reached out to us and said, hey, I have an idea. Would you want to partner with us? And so I met with him and um, we formed uh, the neighborhood grounds crew as it's known today. And so we have a core group of about 30 volunteers, um, the grounds crew, per se, and uh, we go out at least once a month and clean up um, about a four or five block radius around Wrigley Field in every direction, which is a pretty substantial area. Um, and then to incentivize people, we have a contest throughout the summer um, and the person or last year it was awarded to a family, but we created um, an award at the end of the season called the groundskeeper of the year. And so the people who put forth the most volunteer time and it's peer nominated. So the volunteers uh, self or nominate each other. And then at the end of the year uh, or the end of the summer, we award the groundskeeper of the year award and um that's done in an on-field recognition ceremony at Wrigley Field. Field. Yeah, field. Yeah, it's great. That's awesome. Yeah, so yeah. you know they get to come to the game and then um 
there is a slight cost involved with this, you know, just because we have t-shirts and sometimes we go out to lunch after brunch. Um, so we uh, solicited a corporate partner. So our corporate partner is Hefty. So they've supplied all the supplies for us. Um, and uh, the winner of the groundskeeper of the year wins a year's supply of trash bags from Hefty, you know, which is fun. So it's lighthearted, but it's meaningful at the same yeah. time. And it's a true partnership in our community between an institution like the Cubs and the neighborhood group. So we partner with the East Lakeview neighbors. Um, a couple of park advisory councils. We've worked with the Chicago Parks Foundation. And then, of course, the Aldermanic offices in our office also support us. So it's a great way to bring everyone together outside of the regular course of business and make a noticeable impact right yeah. away. And so yeah. in the first year that we're in our third year now of this group, but the first year, we picked up, I think, um, like close to 6,000 pounds of trash over the summer. We covered we like every time. 30 square, square miles, you know, I mean, it yeah, like, it, you it, have the metrics, right? Yeah, like, it's it, absolutely yeah. like it's, it's so noticeable. So yeah, we've been able to engage high school kids as well who need service hours. Um, yeah. You know, so they come out, it's a great family activity because anyone can do it. And, you know, picking up trash is also, there's a Zen slash humbling <laughs> experience yeah. there, you know. Yeah, I've done it on the beaches and uh, yeah. parks. Here, yeah, I mean, so, it's not yeah. glamorous, yeah. but it's really worthwhile at the end of the day. And, you know, and it's a quick activity. We usually are only out for an hour. You could do yeah. a lot in an hour. It doesn't have oh, to be. Oh, it's great. A well, you know, anyone yeah. can uh, look up Heather and uh, find <laughs> out more about how you could really start a uh, cleanup project yeah. in your urban area. So Heather, I don't know if you have like additional comments around, you know, why, you know, the fabric of neighborhood matters and these trends in terms of, of numbers, maybe you're feeling it in Lakeview or other uh, neighborhoods in the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, affordability is a, is a, a big issue here in Chicago. Um, in fact, Mayor Lightfoot formed um, a housing task force, and just last week they released their high-level report, and a lot needs to be done um, in Chicago to create more affordable housing options, especially for families. So, 13 years ago, to this point, 13 years ago, the city adopted um, the Affordable Requirements Ordinance, which uh, requires develop developers to provide affordable units in new developments. And uh, in just 13 years, I'm just reading from the report right now, um, in the 13 years since the ordinance was adopted, only 1,049 homes were set aside as affordable housing and usually they're condos within a larger development and they're typically one bedroom or studio apartments which doesn't allow for a family to live in right so it misses the mark and the report also states that there is a need to the housing gap is nearly 120,000 homes. So this puts large swaths of the city out of reach for many Chicagoans. So I think this is interesting. Affordability is a big, big complex issue. Um, I, uh, what you didn't mention in my bio when you were introducing me is that I also ran for Chicago City Council a couple oh, of years ago. <laughs> so I did not win. Um, but affordable housing was a big, big topic during the campaign, you know, as it should be. Um, fair and equitable housing, I think, is a basic human right. And if we're not building the housing, that will accommodate the people who need it most, then what are what are we actually doing? You know, well, we're doing a it to check a also, box. right? Yeah. Because if you yeah. put controls and restrictions on the builders, right. they're not gonna build. Right, right. exactly. There's no incentive, because it's right. a big risk. To build a unit, 
it's a huge risk, a huge yeah. risk. And you need to be able to sell or rent the condos. Right. You need to have a makeup of residence that gels, right? Right. That, that is, you know, that, that functions and everybody needs to pitch in in some capacity. Right. So it's a, it's a very complex, it's a very complex right. issue. And I think yeah. we, we looked into developing a reef because there are so many, um, you can't just put in these restrictions, these demand on builders and expect them to build. Right. They're not going to build. I mean, that's right. what, and same with rent control. They're not yeah. going to renovate. No. The, the buildings are not going to be renovated. No. They're not, if there's rent control as pricing, building maintenance is going up. Right. So is how do we, and, and it's the other piece is also making, making it, uh, maybe it's about reducing all of the fees that yes. the city, um, that cities put on to builders, right? To have a property, the taxes, the, but, but all of the permitting requirements that add to the construction costs mm -hmm. that needs to be recouped some way. I mean, that analysis also needs to, to be done. And there needs to be, it's, it's a whole other, I think it, it's a really, it's, it's an issue that needs to bring a lot of stakeholders at the table to yeah. really innovate, to think about it completely differently and right I, was, my father was very involved in developing co-ops mm -hmm. as a mean of of developing um affordable housing so that people were owners of the building and the and the, the co-op and the cost of the building um yeah. that is you know one one model um with 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 its limitations as well so right. it's uh, it's really um it's a big issue, but yeah, it is an issue because people leave and then you're left with, with no residents. So, right. Right. And that's like population loss is an issue in Chicago. And it talks about this later in the brief. And the other thing I think we're about to get to, um, as we continue on is a, the role of government, which is very important, but also zoning reform is yeah. a great way to make this happen. But, and what you said about out of the box thinking and being innovative, we can't fall into the bucket of like, well, that's the way we've always done it because the history shows it doesn't work. Right. And so how can we create fair and equitable neighborhoods where everyone prospers and it, and it makes sense for people like developers and, um, and others to invest and take the risk because you're spot on in what you're what you're saying, and the incentives don't necessarily always come in the forms form of tax breaks, right? Like there's other ways to incentivize people to to build and invest and take the risk, and that's that's what needs to happen. I love the idea of co-ops, like that's fantastic. I don't I don't think any co-ops are built in Chicago currently, but right. I mean, um, that is a model. Yeah. Well, let's go on. I invite you okay. to read the putting it into context, giving right. a bit of a history. Sure. Um, on neighborhoods. Uh, our brief are always include this historical perspective in terms of how do we get there, where it all started, which is always interesting because a lot of times reforms or decisions are made to solve a problem. And if we know that, then we can avoid repeating the problem, you know, later on. I can actually speak to this from personal experience. So you mentioned my work with the Lakeview Chamber of Commerce. I was actually the executive director for 13 years. And we received a community block grant through the city of Chicago. It's a pass-through program. And I will say that the funding declined year over year. So we received the grant every single single year, but it would decline year over year just because the, the funding was drying up from the Fed, as it, it says um, in what you just read. I would also argue that the grant was worthwhile but not substantial enough to make a measurable impact in our community. So we would use it for like business um, attraction and retention initiatives, some workforce development, some local promotion, you know, uh, tourism. Uh, but it was never really enough to make a huge, a huge difference, but it was, we were a small organization. And so if we, didn't receive the grant or get that funding, it would impact us financially. Um, so I think the city of Chicago from the Fed 
received a few million dollars in this grant program, but it would be spread out over 77 community areas. So the average grant was about $30,000 for the whole year, which is not a lot of, not a lot of money. Um, so I think it's, it's very interesting. And what, and what the brief states is that, um, you know, whether or not the block grants are worthwhile. I think they can be worthwhile, but it needs to be rethought of how they're distributed and um, and how the money is actually being used, how the funds are right, being and used. how it's evaluated. It's yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, we could, yeah, it's, um, it's a worthwhile program, but it definitely needs, it needs reform. Yeah, and it's interesting. It also is, comes to question, you know, the the idea of the federal government being involved at that level of of, of uh, funding of yeah. small communities, right? right? And, and then might be the United States is built on this principle of local power and control. Right. Right. In this case, I mean, that's the idea of the block grant. They're not telling you what to do. Um, and the states decides how to distribute it. Right. Uh, but again, it opens the door to corruption and giving the grant to people who are, um, you know, to groups that, that, that are favored. So right. you know, there's real, well, real criteria for it. Yeah. Well, the corruption piece is interesting as well because, uh, there's there's room for corruption everywhere obviously right but what's interesting aside from that is that if you're a small local chamber of commerce and you're receiving this money from the city of chicago and it's just enough to plug a hole in your budget then you're beholden to the to the city or beholden to the funder correct and so it makes it more difficult to push back against things oh, right. you know, that may not benefit your community necessarily. So right. there's some, some local politics involved, involved yeah. in that. It's so it's, it's, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's really, it's interesting. It's in, yeah, it's, it's, inter yeah, it is a, it is really a dilemma. In bigger cities, 15% of elections were uncontested, but only 25% of New York city's registered voters and only 20% of Los Angeles voters participated in mayoral races in 2017. Chicago is the same. Yeah. It's very disappointing. People need to vote. Yeah, people need to vote and care about local, local. Yes. Local. So much, and also, I think, that, you know, one piece that this does not mention is there's no more local media for local news, very local neighborhood news to, to draw your attention to it. You only hear about the murders, you know, you, but, but very like, it's, it's always an aggregate news. It's not like super local mm -hmm. news for you to right. own and, and know what's going on in, in your area. Right. That's positive. There's not, it's hard to find out. I think the patch is one attempt to, to do that, but you really mm -hmm. need to subscribe and be committed to, right. uh, to your neighborhood. And I think yeah. it, forget about that. Maybe even like young people that move in, yeah. uh, that would be like something to, to just really keep in, keep in mind. Right. And say, I guess, so. Well, and that's sort of to the point of um, why it's important to participate and to, you know, walk out your front door instead of your back door, you know, and meet your neighbors and participate in your local community group. Um, Community groups are really uh, a force in Chicago, and I attend close to 100 community meetings a year. Most of them are just covering the regular course of business, you know, and that's where you meet the people who live and work in your community. It's where you get the best information, quite honestly, because just like you said, the local media isn't going to pick up most of what's going on. It's how you can find out about businesses opening, businesses closing, you know, um, you know, unfortunate, you know, to hear about crime, but like, like petty crimes, like just basic theft, theft from garages, muggings, you know, not everything in Chicago is a homicide. There's other crimes that occur as well. But then, you know, learn about new developments, maybe who's, you know, things that are going on at the school. So it's really, really important to, to participate in that way. And um, 
you know, go out your front door and not your, not your back door. Yeah, I love you that. Know, it's like, yeah, and that's a great yeah. thing to keep in mind. Yeah. yeah. And to teach our kids. I think that's part of civics, you yeah. know, when you yeah. think about it's part of civics and oftentimes we think about civics education, we think about the U S constitution, but I feel like more and more as I'm looking at this and the policy circle is about inspiring and informing and developing civic leaders. It's about really locally and understanding how it functions and knowing your neighbor, yeah. knowing who's on your block. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we're, you're, re we're responsible for that. You know, yeah. we, and we're accountable to what's going on around us. Like I could go on for days yeah, about I that. Know. It's so, imp it's so important. So there's a whole study and um, there's a link here uh, and a picture from uh, the U.S. Small Business Administration around uh, the, the economic impact of small businesses, how 67 cents stays in the local community when people, um, uh, support small businesses. Do you have like some, um, I know like that's a big issue in terms of inviting small businesses mm -hmm. to thrive in, in a neighborhood and yeah. neighborhood being um, marketing itself almost to businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, um, this, uh, you know, strikes a chord with me given all the years I spent working at the Lakeview Chamber of Commerce and um, you know, it goes back to the commitment to your community and especially the importance of um, being committed to shopping local. If the desire of the community is for small locally owned businesses to thrive, then that's where they have to spend their money. And, you know, the data has shown for decades that money spent at a local business stays in the hyper local economy. And it's more than that. If you, um, you know, supporting a local business means you're also su supporting that family, you're supporting their livelihood. They likely, you know, the owners likely live close by and participate in other ways. And so for me personally, I think of it as who do I want to give my money to? You know, like I, do I want to give my money to Amazon? you know, or do I want to give it to the local retailer who I probably am on a first name basis with if I'm a, a regular shopper. Now, now they also use Amazon to grow. Yeah, their exactly. Products. I was going to say they like, the Amazon effect. Yeah, right. Is, so yeah. the Amazon effect is huge. And, you know, and also given, you know, I'm a working mom and I have a busy life. And so I can't always like go shop. Yeah. Sometimes I have to order online just by circumstances. Right. But when it comes to certain things, you know, I re I do make a conscious decision. Who do I want to have my money? I work yeah, hard for too. my money, you know? And so if yeah, I want to still be harder. able, yeah, if yeah, I want to make that, that choice. Yeah. So, so do you live in, live in a news desert? There's an interactive map uh, on the University of North Carolina Hussman School of Journalism and Media uh, that, that you could use. So that's what we were just talking about, about the news. Yeah. And, and now there's new apps and you kind of need to almost look at it as your local news outlet, right? Yeah. Next door. And I think in, in uh, it's used very effectively even by um, local, you know, representatives and mm -hmm. city management to communicate with citizens, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, it's a slippery slope though. Um, I know newsrooms across the country as this, illustrates are shrinking and true professional journalism is shrinking with it as well and especially at the in the hyper, hyper local space so it's important um, I know in Chicago there's um, a publication called that's all online called Black Club that um, started a little over a year ago and is neighborhood based and they've been able to slowly expl expand um, and add additional neighborhoods over the past um, year since their formation, but they rely on subscriber dollars to keep them going. So it is reader funded, um, which, you know, they're, I think that their reporting is fair and authentic and they cover a lot of very local issues, which is helpful. Um, but there's a chance, you know, they have to hustle for subscribers too. And yeah. so there's a chance that they could, they could go away. They're doing well now, but 
you know, I don't know how sustainable it will be. Um, yeah, because it's really hard to maintain. Yeah, I mean, the tax incentive, it needs to be consistent. It could be, it should be one tax structure and companies, you know, look at it in different cities and it, you shouldn't have these special tax structures depending on the size of the company. It should be, it should just be the same for everyone. Otherwise, you're, you are penalizing the small local businesses that have been there or in favor of just the large companies um, that may or may not deliver. Yeah, I agree. And I think transparency in this space is also really important. Yeah. You know, at Amazon, we Chicago put together a bid package for Amazon as well. And, um, you know, it just seemed like it was never, it was played very close to the vest. And some of that is necessary, but you know, if the taxpayers of Chicago are going to carry the burden, I think we're, we have a right to know what burden we're going to be carrying. (laughs) Yeah. And then why favor one company? So there's a call out box. It says states pass legislation to fund immigrant integration programs, which often include English and citizenship classes, as well as regulate licensing, which can reduce barriers. So educated immigrants can use their professional skills. Such endeavors allow immigrants to develop social bonds and to contribute to their communities economically. So this is what we were talking about uh, earlier with the importance of great school Mm -hmm. to bring people together and to have these real institutions that create in which people can create bond and care for each other Um, as well as a green space. The High Line is amazing in Chicago and and there's one in Chicago and the one in New York, how it really transformed completely a neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, In my introduction, you mentioned the Lakeview Area Master Plan and that was a strategic visioning plan we worked on and released to the community um, actually almost 10 years ago, which seems um, crazy to think that it's been that long. But a big part of the plan was creating communal spaces or nodes throughout the area so that people could gather and get to know each other. Um, And further, something that came from the plan later is that we saw the need to really develop like diverse, a diverse, dense destination that could attract all different kinds of people, you know, and speaking to the open spaces, like not every open space needs to be a playground. You know, the High Line is a great example of that. It's a multi-generational space that's appealing to all different groups and types of people and all and people with all abilities and, you know, the economic status doesn't matter and what have you. And so, you know, the 606 in Chicago is similar. In Lakeview, we have the low line, which connects the Roscoe um, or the Southport Brown Line stop with the Paulina Brown Line stop. And it's about 70% finished now, but it's full of murals on the neighboring buildings, the pedestrian walkway, And while it's under an active rail line, it's really meant to produce connectivity between two commercial corridors. So there's a plaza at the Southport station and there's a plaza at the Paulina station where activities can take place like outdoor concerts, farmer markets, um, art installations and what have you. And then people can easily walk back and walk back and forth if they like. And it's about a three block span in between the two stations. So out of the box thinking like that in urban areas is really important, but also to the point of like, just going to the library or a small community festival, not everything has to be complex and complicated. It's little, little simple things can make a big difference. Yeah. And I think well. these places to convene, right. Mm-hmm. Um, having these plaza and that's the, the old way of, of yeah. design, having these yeah. town centers or, you know, these plaza and that, I mean, I think the, the words come from Piazza, right. And yeah. Really, really, but, to have these places of gathering so that festivals, small events can be yeah. organized. Just in, yeah. in my neighborhood, they organize an, a vintage car parade mm-hmm. yeah. that started you know, at the train station and then kind of drove to the Wilmette Historical Society. Well, just that, it just invites everybody to show up and then you see neighbors you didn't know they own old cars and yeah. felt it was amazing, especially in the context of this pandemic, how my heart was warmed by just 
showing up with my dog, seeing these old yeah. cars and, and just feel like, oh, this was a place of just convening yeah. people, just getting together um, and, and seeing others and just saying hi to, to right. This. So it's well, something that needs to be part of when, when we look at the overall fabric of neighborhood and yeah. it's construction and its design, but also there's this layer of events where you need leaders in the community to spearhead these, these events. Right. Yeah. You can't come well, from the city council that it has yeah. to somebody in the neighborhood saying, we're going to do this. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think that's one of the, the great parts of um, the Wrigley Field campus now at, that our redevelopment done is the plaza at Gallagher Way, which the vision always was to create a town square or a central destination. And to be honest, um, that's why I wanted to go to work for the Cubs and Tom Ricketts was because of his vision for that. That's what I, that's something that I really believe in. And so having been able to be a part of that and, you know, the launch and um, being able to participate in the design of the programming and what have you, and then seeing the benefits every single day has been tremendous and a huge, yeah. huge gift. I think it's amazing also yeah. how people really innovate, right? They see this yeah. space and they come to you to say, hey, we want to do yoga in the morning. You're yeah. like, we want to do movie nights during the summer. We want to do, we want to make this a starting point for a running group. Mm -hmm. There's all these little groups that have a point to to gather and uh, and then to to launch together. So I think this is such an, an important section. So um, Heather, I invite you to read a little bit more about zoning, and then because sure. I think it's part of that, right? Because it's about yes, it's huge. However much. However, how much cities can demand from private developers is contested and whether or not these policies can produce a significant number of units to fit the growing need for affordable housing remains to be seen. This is um, what I was referring to earlier with the affordable requirement ordinance in Chicago. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what we were talking about. Well, the zoning also needs to take into account the change in what, the way businesses are run. The creative, you know, there's zoning for just storefront areas. And today, the, the creation process, like if you create a product and you're selling it all online, you might not have a storefront. It might just be the creative process. And you kind of yeah. need to allow the storefronts to not just be storefronts, to also yeah. be production centers or offices. And I know in our um, neighborhood, you know, a small bakery wanted to have their office next to the bakery. And they were like, oh no, we couldn't do it because yeah. the zoning did not allow for an office to be. It was for a storefront, not an office. Right. They couldn't do it because of zoning. And this is, right. this is where I think there needs to be out of the box thinking. Yes. As work, life, you know, yeah. selling all merge, living and working is all together now. Right. Well, and especially now during the pandemic, you know, we're recording this during the pandemic and people may listen to this podcast in a few years and think like, oh, you know, it'll be in hindsight then. But for right now in the present moment, our lawmakers and community influencers really need to be thinking much larger you know the vision needs to be much bigger i think than than it is currently and um just recently the chicago city council um approved and is adopting the accessory dwelling unit ordinance which will allow for um the development of coach houses or like a garden apartment what some people call like the granny flat or that like an in-law apartment it was called in the past and that's a great idea in theory because it allows um, for a, an extra unit maybe in your home you know where your maybe your mother-in-law will live or you could rent it out and have a little bit of additional income but the the ordinance is really heavily regulated so it makes it like almost impossible to build an, an accessory dwelling unit and so it's like i think that uh, city councils and lawmakers need to get out of their own way sometimes. And, you know, if you're going to put forth a, prog an, a progressive idea like that, then let the idea live. And then on the other side, I, 
zoning can be can overregulate, I think, and make it impossible for for businesses to thrive and for developers to be able to build affordable housing and you know for for communities to be fair and equitable. There the ba- there has to strike a balance. Yeah. You know, and even just like going back to the park to the plaza at Gallagher Way at Wrigley Field, that <laughs> our private property has a city ordinance that governs how we can use it. It's called the Sports Plaza Ordinance. It's heavily regulated. And it's our own private property and we built it. It was built for the common good and to benefit the community, but but you it's know, heavily regulated. Yeah, it right, right down to the hours of operation and like the size of the drinks that we can serve. Yeah. That's crazy. It, <laughs> it is. And also, I think this, we have another brief that is called What is Aging, right? As mm-hmm. we are having, uh, people are living longer, living yeah. longer in their homes, families may be caring for their elderly. Um, you know, the, the aging of a population impacts also the, the architecture and it impacts the design of cities and the services that are offered to people. And that needs to be taken into account in that out of the box thinking. And, yeah. and that's what came to mind when you were thinking, when you were saying, talking about this accessory dwelling, you yeah. know, it's for caring for your elderly family member who right. might have Alzheimer's that you want to have close to you. Right. Yeah. Um, and you need to allow for, you can't control everything. And, and it's always, you need to allow for the imagination and the creativity to flourish um, in, in a way that benefits, as you said, yeah. the common good. And, yeah. and that's where, and that's, that kind of thinking needs to be brought to city uh, management and and the city lawmakers. So, and this is a conversation in which Heather participated uh, that really talks about the roles of uh, professional sports team in, in communities. So um, thank you. So thank you, Heather, for You're welcome. participating in this. And, um, and then, uh, you know, for everything that you do and being an inspiration oh, and, uh, and being a leader in your community, uh, developing this brief, I know had me really turn to my community and, and really look at this concept of neighborhood uh, development. So, yeah, no, it's great. I love, um, I loved the conversation and uh, it just, it's neighborhoods are wonderful obviously. Um, and there's a lot of simple acts that can take place to make a neighborhood stronger. Not everything has to be a big heavy lift, you know, like there's just little things like the brief talks about, you know, organizing your neighbors, starting a community group and meeting regularly or, or like you suggest at the end, which I think is the best about how to get involved is to seek what already might be there. Yeah. And, you know, you and know, build on that. Yeah. And build from yeah. that. Yeah. And affect yeah. change that way. So it's, it's been great. Yeah. No, thank you so much. And, you know, I invite everyone, if you are not already part of uh, the policy circle to visit the policy circle.org and to be a convener, be a uh, start, uh, be a convener in your community and engage people in uh, this discussion. It yeah. could uh, be a starting point to develop a master plan or a vision for your community and a really great way to constructively engage with your representative because they want to hear from us and they want to think out of the box. Um, and I think everyone needs to be to care and, and be involved. So I invite you to share the brief and also visit the policy circle.org. So thank All right. you. Thank you so much, Heather, for doing this.